Welcome from central London. We're just a stone's throw away from the Houses of Parliament in Westminster. We're here in Central Hall for this Intelligence Square debate on the Catholic Church is a force for good in the world. Well, that's a subject that's going to generate a lot of heat, I think, and um, some light too, I hope. I'm delighted to be chair of this debate. We have a panel which includes some of the most provocative, intelligent and stimulating commentators and practitioners on the subject. Arguing for the motion, the Archbishop of Abuja in Nigeria, John Onayakin, the British Conservative MP, Anne Widdicombe. Arguing against the motion, the actor, broadcaster and author, Stephen Fry, and the journalist and commentator, Christopher Hitchens. Well, our first speaker, is John Onayakin, His Grace, the Archbishop of Abuja, the capital of Nigeria. And His Grace is one of Africa's best known, most respected commentators of the church, the Catholic Church. He was um, appointed Archbishop by John Paul II in 1994. He's also president of the Christian Association in Nigeria. Archbishop, please make your way to the podium. I'm going to give you this little sound to um, warn you that you have about two minutes left before your allotted time is over. So please make your way to the podium. Speak at the microphone. Okay. I thank Zainab very much for this. Uh, a wonderful introduction. I see her face so often in BBC. It's nice to see her live. Uh, friends, um, I, must, I certainly must say I'm grateful to be here for this occasion, and I thank Pis uh, Nick Pisani, our friend, for bringing me here. Not only for bringing me to this occasion, but for giving me the opportunity to speak on this topic, because it's, for me it's more than a matter of debate, because that's what my life is all about. If I didn't believe that the Catholic Church is a force for good, I would not devote my whole life to precisely working in that institution, hoping that I am involved in something that is good for the whole world. And um, I believe that uh, I, this conviction is not without reason, and I, am, I hope that before before my 12 minutes is over, I would have given enough reasons for it. You see, for me, to be a Catholic is a gift of God, but a gift that I received through my parents. Yeah, and my parents permit me to digress a bit. They were the first generation of Christians in my village, and uh, my father really believed strongly. He, he went beyond the, uh, the, the wonderful traditions of our traditional religion and embraced the Christian faith because he saw in it something better. Not because he didn't like our religion, but he saw something better. Uh, and he remained faithful to that to the very end until he died at 91. Now, I'm, I'm 65 years old, and I have made my own journey, too, along this line. And uh, so far, with no, no regrets. On the contrary, I'm daily, every day, more convinced that the Catholic Church is a force for good in the world. Let me, now, let me proceed by trying to unpack this, the, some of the major elements in this, um, in this topic. Let me start with the word church, the Catholic church. Obviously, it means many things to many people, but I think as an archbishop, I should be in the position to say what it does mean, especially to us Catholics. Yes, the Catholic Church is, is an institution, and some people say it is perhaps the best organized institution in the world, but that's not really the essence of our church. We should go beyond the institution, and for us, the church is first and foremost a community of believers. 
And this is a community of believers that is spread all over the world, made up of all kinds of people. And the institution itself, as well as those whom we can normally consider church people, people dressed up like me, for example, we are there only because of that huge community of people who claim who are Catholics. I'm stressing this so that when you are asking yourself, is the Catholic Church a force for good in the world? Don't look at me. Don't look at Benedict XVI. Look at the Catholics all over the world. Wherever there is a Catholic, there is the Catholic Church. This is the church that we are talking about in this debate. You meet them, you meet Catholics all over, wherever you are. That the church is a force for good in the world seems obviously to me is quite obvious. The question probably we should ask is, what kind of force? There was once an arrogant dictator who asked in disdain, how many battalions has the Pope? Obviously, he completely missed the point. It's not about military force or physical force, but it is about force. It's about the force of a spiritual message, the force of values, which has stood the test of 2,000 years, and not only 2,000 years in time, but has spread its message all over the world among different, different kinds of people, different races, and it is a force that is made up also of the spiritual and the moral, moral values that the faith carries with it. We know we are not the only ones with those values, and especially we share it with other Christians, and we even share it with others who believe in certain, certain strict values about life. And we believe the world is a better place the more there are values that guides activities. The church is a force for good in in, its, uh, in what it teaches. And I want to refer especially uh, recently our Pope wrote out a, an encyclical letter which is our own, a most, a most uh, authoritative teaching in a document he called Caritas in Veritate, meaning charity in the truth. And there he not only, um, he not only analyzed the problems of injustice in our world, but actually came out with very very, very interesting guidelines to assist the world to come out of its present confusion, if they would only listen. Uh, we must also not forget the sheer weight of the number of Catholics. I have checked the statistics, and we are told that now we have about 1.2 billion Catholics all over the world, out of a population of 6.6 .6 billion, 17.3 percent, and these are young, these are made up of all categories of people, young and old, women and men, peasant farmers and high-tech professionals, simple citizens, and even heads of states and world leaders. This is the great army that is a great force for good in the world. And whatever they are doing, we consider it as being done largely also as a result of the spirit that guides them. Now let's come further to a more concrete area of the kind of things that the Catholic Church does all over the world, the network of initiatives that the church is engaged in, especially in the area of social welfare and development, which people like me, from where I come from, I'm constantly in touch with what the church is doing. Independent statistics have shown that the Catholic Church is doing far more than its numbers and its population would probably suggest. The action of the church is most significant in communities that are reduced to poverty and misery by human neglect and sometimes by hostile environments. Whether it be schools, or hospitals, clinics, refugee camps, HIV and AIDS, in all these areas, if you go to those places in those circumstances and ask them, they will tell you that the Catholic Church is a force for good for them and a force for good for the world. Talking of statistics, I spoke recently with the Director General of UNAIDS, which is the United Nations Agency for HIV and AIDS, and he said that 26% of the health institutions in the world directly involved with the treatment of HIV and AIDS are run by the Catholic Church. And this is an underestimation because I do know that most of, many, many times what we do are not reported to UNAIDS. 
which just shows where we are going. The same thing, kind of, the same thing can be said of schools and clinics. And please note that it is a well-known policy of our church that whenever we are engaged in social welfare work, it is always given to all without, without any discrimination, whether you believe or not, irrespective of creed. Therefore, in a world where very often things go according to sectarian lines and polarized, this is surely a, f a great force for good. Mind you, I have not in any way suggested in all I have said so far that uh, the Catholics are the best people in the world, far be it. Indeed, it is an integral part of our faith that our church is made up of saints and sinners. We are all struggling towards that perfection which Jesus asked us all to, uh, to first follow. Nor am I denying that the Catholic Church has always and everywhere been do, done excellent things, even sometimes in high levels. But uh, this, again, only proves that we are in this world. Even the late Pope John Paul II was, had no difficulty at all in admitting the, the mistakes that people who claim to be, church, to be Catholics and working in the name of the church have done in the past, and even apologized. And such gestures of apology is very rare in our world today. We should also be careful how we judge people of other times, because we do not know how those who will come after us will judge us. Let me conclude by, in, by drawing your attention to one particular aspect of my faith which I admire greatly. My, we are very open to dealing and moving and collaborating with others. And this is showing itself more and more, definitely in the countries where I come from. We reach out to others. We have uh, a whole baggage of, of, of uh, doctrinal positions as well as way and policies which encourages us to look around anywhere you see anybody doing good, link hands with them. And I think this is very important for the world of our days. We are talking of the world of today. We need more and more efforts to link hands across all divides so that we can manage to make our planet a better place. A world of justice and peace. Is there still anybody here who still doubts whether the Catholic Church <laughs> is a force for good in the world? Thank you very much. Archbishop, Archbishop, thank you. And you were admirable in your timing. I didn't have to do this at all to uh, tell you that uh, you were coming to the end of your time. Our next speaker is Christopher Hitchens. He's arguing against the motion. Christopher Hitchens is uh, British by origin, but he has spent most of his working life in the United States. He is a writer, journalist, and commentator, particularly well known for his um, trenchant and uh, views and very original thinking. He works on Vanity Fair magazine, where he memorably wrote uh, a rather a less than complimentary profile, I would have to say, Christopher, of uh, the late Mother Teresa. Uh, so, Christopher Hitchens, let us hear what you have to say. Your time starts now. Please make your way to the podium. Well, Your Grace, um, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, um, and Zainab, who did something that I almost never have had experienced before, uh, paid a compliment to my shirt before we came on tonight. <laughs> so I was able to return by pointing to hers, which you, you're feasting your eyes on now, and saying, I once saw Norman St. John Stevens, now Lord Stevens of Forley, wearing a shirt just like that on the television. <laughs> and he was asked by his interviewer, gosh, what a lovely shirt, where did you get it? And Stevens said, do you really like it? He said, I, I call it sort of crushed cardinal. <laughs> I might add, in the spirit of fraternity, which I'm sure will inform this entire soiree, that the mere existence of Lord Stevens of Forley is testimony to the breadth of the church. 
Um, now, I'm sorry, though, to have to begin by disagreeing with His Grace. Um, if you're going to be a serious grown-up person and appear to defend the Catholic Church in public in front of an educated and literate audience, you simply have to start by making a great number of heartfelt apologies and requests for contrition and forgiveness. Now, you might ask, you're fully entitled to ask, brothers and sisters, who am I to say that? Well, in the Jubilee millennium year of 2000, the Vatican spokesman, Bishop Piero Marini, said, explaining a whole sermon of apology given by His Holiness the Pope that was supposed to cover the entire history of the Church in its Jubilee year, that I'll quote uh, Bishop Marini directly, he said, given the number of sins we've committed in the course of 20 centuries, reference to them must necessarily be rather summary. Well, I think Bishop Marini had that just about right. I'll have to be summary too. But I think he said just about the least of it. His Holiness on that occasion, it was March the 12th, 2000, if you wish to look it up, begged forgiveness for, among some other things, the Crusades, the Inquisition, the persecution of the Jewish people, injustice towards women, that's half the human race right there, <laughs> and the forced conversion of indigenous peoples, especially in South America. And that followed a whole series of preceding apologies, or apologies, I would say, of a kind, made by the late Pope John Paul, who, it troubles me not at all to say, was a very impressive and serious human being. Um, it followed no less than 94, 94 count them, uh, public recognitions on his part of appalling crime and error and cruelty and stupidity and offenses to the free intelligence, ranging from, I shall be summary, like Bishop Marini, the African slave trade apologized for in 1995, uh, the admission that Galileo was right <laughs> about the relationship between the sun and the earth and other orbs, which came in 1992, one might add, and I won't say, it's too easy to say better late than never, here, I said it. <laughs> to violence and torture, legalized torture. Torture was legalized and institutionalized by the Roman pontiff during the Counter-Reformation. That came in 1995. Um, and for silence during Hitler's final solution, or Shoah. As well as, in 1999, coming in just under the Millennium Jubilee wire, an apology for the burning alive in the main square of Prague of the great Czech Protestant Jan Hus. Um, since that big fiesta of forgiveness that uh, began in, uh, well, culminated, I might say, in 2000, fiesta of forgiveness, fiesta of asking for it, the papacy is also asked to be forgiven for the sack of Constantinople and the massacre of Byzantine Christianity in April 1204 as part of the Fourth Crusade, the anathema on all Eastern Orthodox Christians as unbelievers, heretics, and people dwelling outside the health of the church was lifted only in 1964. I call your attention to that. He also expressed sorrow about the murder and forced conversion of Serbian Orthodox Christians in the Balkans during the Second World War. And it doesn't end there. There are smaller but significant, um, equally significant, avowals of a very bad conscience. These have included uh, regret for the rape and the torture of orphans and other children in church-run schools in almost every country on earth from Ireland to Australia. And I'm pleased to see that due reconsideration is now being given and may in fact have been given to the hellish, I choose the word carefully, doctrine of limbo, St. Augustine's uh, cruel and stupid disposal problem solution to a non-existent problem, that is to say, the destination of the souls of unbaptized children. Up until now, Catholic parents have been taught that's where their unbaptized children went, a form of torture that's sometimes worse than the physical. Now it seems that this piece of Augustinian sadism is undergoing reconsideration as well. But remember, this is from a church that, on the whole, cannot err. We still await a more direct admission. For example, I would give some suggestions of my own while we're at it. I would like them to take back the Concordat made with Adolf Hitler, the first treaty he ever signed, giving the church a monopoly over education in Germany in exchange for the dis dissolution of the Catholic Center Party to give the Nazi Party a clear run. I'd apologize for the Lateran Pact with Mussolini, myself, also the first treaty ever signed 
by that fascist dictator. I would also think I'd want to reconsider the fact that Father Tizo, head of the Nazi puppet state in Slovakia, was a priest in holy orders. That the Croatian fascist puppet state, the Ustasha state of Ante Pavlic, was also operating under full clerical protection and disguise, as was the regime of General Franco and the dictator Antonio Salazar. And I'd also want, I really think I would beg forgiveness for this, I don't think the German church should have asked Hitler's birthday to be celebrated from the pulpit every year until he died. These are very serious matters, and they're not to be laughed off by references to the occasional work of Catholic charities. But I draw your attention not just to the apologies, ladies and gentlemen, but to the evasive and euphemistic form that they take. Uh, Joseph Ratzinger, the current pope, considered by some, by Catholics, to be the vicar of Christ on earth, says of Indians, of the Indians who were massacred in the course of conversion in Brazil, after the apology had been made to them, he said, nonetheless, it must be remembered that before we came to convert them, they were silently awaiting the arrival of the church. I don't think that's a very genuine kind of apology to you. In his comment, one of the few he's made on the institutionalization of rape and torture and maltreatment of children in Catholic institutions, he said, it's a very severe crisis which, which involves us, he said, in the following, in the need for applying to these victims the most loving pastoral care. Well, I'm sorry. They've already had that. <laughs> and to say that this is the responsibility laid upon you by the, the horrific admission that you've already had to make is not accepting responsibility in any adult sense. When I say child abuse was institutional, how dare I say so? How can I prove it? How can I prove such a thing? Well, I'll ask, the, I'll ask His Grace, and I'll ask Anne Whittacombe. Where is Cardinal Bernard Law now? Where is he? Where is the Cardinal Archbishop of Boston, whose resignation was indignantly demanded, finally, by 50 members of the church and by the whole laity of Massachusetts, who also demanded his prosecution for the promotion and protection and covering up and uh, apology for and defense of uh, people whose crimes against children are too revolting to specify. And he's not in the jurisdiction of Massachusetts now, as perhaps you know. He's the supreme vicar of the Church of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome, personally appointed by the Pope to that as well as many other important sinecures. And in 2005, this man, a fugitive from justice and from, and from complicity in the filthiest crime that it's possible for a human being to imagine, was one of those voting in conclave to decide who the next vicar of Christ on earth will be. I don't know. I think, I think I'd like to hear a bit more shame about this. I think I'd like to see a bit more confrontation with the, with, the, with the reality of the business. Now, this is a, a, a serious question, as I've said, and Whittacombe very often rightly, in my opinion, attacks the climate of moral relativism and of anything goes that can very well be the handmaiden of postmodernist hedonistic culture. I very often am glad that she points these thing, things out, but the rape and torture of children is not something to be relativized. It's not something to be excused as a few bad priests. It's certainly not to be excused by the hideously false claim made by some Catholic conservatives that this wouldn't have happened if queers hadn't been allowed into the church. I'm sorry to say that queerdom in the church is an old story too. Um, and it's worse, it's much worse than pornography and it's much worse than bad language on TV. And it's the crime that cries out for punishment. It's the thing that if we were accused of on this side of the house, we would die rather than admit. And if we were guilty of it, we'd kill ourselves. And it's the one thing the church has decided to excuse itself for under this papacy. The same euphemism comes in the term some Christians that is used in all the apologies about the, the Crusades, the Inquisitions, uh, the anti-Semitic pogroms, and all the rest of it. It says some Christians fell into error. Some Christians allowed themselves to be to be uh, uh, deceived in this way and to act against the gospel. Well, anti-Semitism was preached as an official doctrine of the church until 1964. Do you think that might have something to do with public opinion in Austria and Bavaria and Poland and Lithuania? That the, the Jewish people were accused collectively as a people of deicide, of the crime of the murder of God in the figure of Jesus of Nazareth. And that, that anathema on them was not lifted until 64, well after 
the uh, perpetrators of the Holocaust had stood trial in secular courts and been rightly punished for their actions. How can this church say it has any moral superiority? It has difficulty catching up to what ordinary people regard as common moral and ethical sense. And it still can't make itself apologize properly. And I'll tell you why. Because, and I'll quote again from the encyclicals, it is said of the Crusades, of the complicity with the Holocaust, of the political and diplomatic alliance with fascism, of all of these things, it is said, well, violence was committed, but I'll stress this, I'll underline it, I'll quote directly, in the service of the truth. So how is an apology possible? How is any understanding or undertaking or firm purpose of amendment to be allowed when the original sin, so to say, the radix malorum, the fons et origo, the problem in the first place, is the belief on the part of this church that it does possess a truth that we don't have, and it does have a God-given right, a warrant, a mandate of heaven to tell other people what to do, not just in their public, but in their private lives. And until that is changed, until that fantastic and sinister and non-founded claim is changed, these crimes will go on repeating themselves, being partially denied, partially admitted when it's too late to do anything else, and covered up. Behind all these crimes and miseries is the denial of what we on this side of the house affirm, which is that the only little candle of hope that our species does possess, our, our poor bare forked primate mammalian species of whom you have two such splendid examples <laughs> on this side of the house and not bad on the other tonight, um, is, the, is the unfettered in intelligence, the method of free inquiry in philosophy and in science, and the, the refusal to admit that any one person can tell you not to do that. It's the one thing I might say, I think is, if not sacrosanct or sacred, is, shall we say, essential. And the church has always stood and still stands against it. Now, in the little time remaining to me, I'll just propose a few more apologies that we might hope to hear uh, in the immediate future. Because if there'll come a time when the church will issue apologies and explanations and half-baked appeals for forgiveness for things it's still doing. The readmission as a bishop of Roger Williamson, a member of Marcel Lefebvre's fan fanatical, hysterical breakaway sect, so-called Society of St. Pius X. Roger Williamson found hiding in a reactionary, quasi-fascistic establishment in Argentina, has long been a believer that, I'll put this shortly, that the Holocaust did not occur but the Jews did kill Christ. In other words, in other words <clears throat> genocide no, deicide yes. He was quite rightly excommunicated some years ago, along with several other members of his ratbag organization. But Joseph Ratzinger has invited him back in to the communion because to him, having this man, this liar, this fraud, this racist, in the church is more important because it's church unity than the things that he said and done and continues to stand for. Is this not a crying scandal? I think that there will be an apology for what happened in Rwanda, the most Catholic country in Africa, one of the most Catholic countries in the world, um, where priests and nuns and bishops are on trial for inciting from their pulpits and on the church's radio stations and newspapers the massacre of their brothers and sisters. Uh, and the papacy was silent on this appalling occasion and everyone in Rwanda knows it and there hasn't yet been a properly written apology for that disgrace. Staying in Africa I think it will one day be admitted with shame that it might have been in error to say that AIDS is bad as a disease, very bad, but not quite as bad as condoms are bad or not as immoral in the same way. I say it I say it in the presence of his grace, and I say it to his face, the preachings of his church are responsible for the death and suffering and misery of millions of his brother and sister Africans, and he should apologize for it. He should show some, some shame. Fourth, for condemning my friend Stephen, Stephen Fry, for his nature, for saying, for saying you couldn't be a member of our church, you're born in sin.
There's a revolting piece of casuistry that's sometimes offered on this point. Yeah, we hate the sin only. We, we love the sinner. Stephen is, I'm sorry to say, not quite like other girls. It's his nature. Actually, he is like other girls in that, in that he's, when I last checked, absolutely boy mad. Um, he's not being condemned for what he does, he's being condemned for what he is. You're a child made in the image of God. Oh, no, you're not. You're a faggot. And you can't join your church and you can't go to heaven. This is disgraceful. It's inhuman. It's obscene. And it comes from a clutch of hysterical, sinister virgins who've already betrayed their charge in the children of their own church. For shame, for shame. And finally, under this pope, as if it wasn't bad enough to try and restore the Latin mass to gratify the mad fascistic followers of Archbishop Lefebvre, uh, but to begin again to offer remission of sin. As, Cardinal, as Bishop Ratzinger, the Pope, I'll call him the Pope for heaven's sake, uh, uh, wants to do. If you come to a Catholic youth festival in Sydney, Australia, where I just was, you'll get a certain remission from purgatory or hell. It may be temporary. If you come a lot and you give a lot, you'll get possibly permanent remission from the eternal punishment that they don't know any more about than you and I do. This is the sale of indulgences blatantly, openly. It's the same temptation that was offered to those who set off on that fourth crusade that's just been apologized for and killed all the Jews of Europe on their way, sacked Byzantine Christianity when they got to Constantinople, and then went on to massacre the Arabs and Muslims. They were offered paradise if they died committing these terrible crimes against humanity. But the, if, if you see what I mean, therefore, the stimulus to crime, the impetus to crime, the belief in certainty, the, the belief that a divine warrant entitles you to do whatever you like, is the sin that must be, that must be canceled, that must be annealed, that must somehow be uh, apologized for. Now, I don't, I don't wish any, I, I'm, I, that's perfect timing. I don't, wish, <laughs> I don't wish any ill on any fellow primate or mammal of mine even if this primate or mammal claims to be a primate in possession of a secret that's denied to me. I can forgive even that because I live in a country where their reign doesn't run, their writ doesn't apply, and they can't burn me and silence me and censor me any more than they can tell my wife that she can't use contraception, or any more than they can really tell Stephen that he's a beast. Um, so I'm not, I don't at all look forward to the death of, uh, of Joseph Ratzinger, I don't, or any other pope, not really. Um, except for one tiny reason which I ought to confess and share with you. When he dies, there's quite a long interval till the conclave can meet, maybe Cardinal Law will still be on it, to pick another pope. Sometimes it goes on for months till they get the white smoke. And for that whole time, that whole interval, it's a delicious, lucid interlude, there isn't anyone on earth who claims to be infallible. <laughs> isn't that nice? <laughs> All I think all I want to propose in closing is this, that if the human species is to rise to the full height that's demanded by its dignity and by its intelligence, we must all of us move to a state of affairs where that condition is permanent, and I think we should get on with it. Okay, thank you for having me. Well, Christopher, thank you very much for all that. Um, our next speaker is going to have her work cut out because she's speaking in favour of the motion that the Catholic Church is a force for good. The Conservative MP and former government minister, Anne Widdicombe, she's as well known for her religious views as for her politics. If you recall, she left the Church of England in 1992 in a blaze of publicity when it allowed the ordination of women priests. The following year she converted to Catholicism and has become one of the most vocal and staunchest defenders of the Catholic Church since then. Anne Widdicombe, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. If apologies are due tonight, they are due from Christopher Hitchens. 
who has just run through one of the longest series of misrepresentations of the Catholic Church that I have heard in a long time. It really is, I think, quite telling that in coping with a motion which says the Catholic Church is a force for good in the world, he has to go back to the Crusades in order to try and disprove it. Or if that's slightly too far back, the sack of Constantinople. He can't actually look at the force that the Catholic Church is in the world today, but I do nevertheless want to join him on his ground, though not sharing any of his conclusions, and just look at some of the things which he has stated. He has said, and actually, you know, no pope pronouncing ex cathedra could ever sound more convinced of truth than when Christopher Hitchens utters something incredibly questionable. But he has said with that certainty which characterizes his utterances, that the Catholic Church has had a history of anti-Semitism. Let us just look at the record of the Catholic Church. When the Jewish community was under the most serious threat that it has faced in recent centuries. And just look at the role that the Catholic Church played in the last World War. Mr. Hitchens ignores the thousands of Jews who were secreted and rescued in churches and monasteries throughout Europe at tremendous risk to the priests and the monks and the nuns who were hiding them. He ignores the 3,000 Jews who in the course of that conflict took refuge in the Pope's own summer palace. He contradicts flatly the statement of so many prominent Jews after 1945 who expressed gratitude to Pius XII, even to the extent of sending the Israeli Philharmonic Orchestra to stage a concert in the Pope's honor. Not, I think, something that they would have done if they had thought he had been anti-Semitic, but rather they recognized that the Catholic Church throughout that period acted within the limitations of the time as a force for good. Martin Gilbert and Michael Burley, historians of very considerable repute, point to the large number of Catholics who found themselves in Dachau. And of course, we should remember that any Christian, not just Catholic, but any Christian joining the SS had first to renounce his faith. So I do not think that a charge of anti-Semitism can stand up. Yes, it is quite true that the New Testament says that the first century Sanhedrin made a very major contribution to the death of Christ. So also did the Romans. And indeed, it's Pontius Pilate that we remember in the Creed every Sunday, not the Sanhedrin. Yet I do not recall Mr. Hitchens suggesting that because of that, the modern Catholic Church is anti Italian. I rather thought it was quite pro-Italian. He also suggests that the Pope welcomed back a Holocaust-denying bishop. Let us first remember that the bishop in question was originally expelled for disobedience. Upon being reinstated and upon reiterating his views, the Pope, a fact conveniently ignored by Mr. Hitchens, commanded him to repent, commanded him to deny what he had said. You would think from listening to Mr. Hitchens that the Catholic Church alone 
has been responsible for atrocities throughout history. If you are going to judge the Catholic Church at any given stage in history, then you have to judge it against the standards that were prevailing at the time. And condemning the Inquisition, which was a horrible thing, condemning the Inquisition in isolation from condemning just about the whole, in fact the whole, of European society which at that time rejoiced in punishment and torture as a means uh, of dealing with criminality and with treason and with wrongdoing. To try and divorce the Catholic Church from that and say that it was uniquely guilty under the Inquisition is simply trying to look back at centuries gone past and apply a standard that nobody applied at the time. And coming nearer to our day, of course Christopher Hitchens is right, and who could possibly dispute with him, that the abuse of children, of innocent children, is one, in fact it is the worst offence that anybody can commit. Of that, no doubt. But again, he seems to think that the Catholic Church should have had some unique insight, which demonstrably was lacking in society as a whole, and I'll give examples at the time. Let's remember that in the 1970s, not the Crusades, not the sack of Constantinople, but in the 1970s, the National Council for Civil Liberties in this country allowed the paedophile information exchange to affiliate to it. And the National Council for Civil Liberties had extremely respectable people at its head, including Harriet Harman and Patricia Hewitt. Would anybody seriously say that they condone child abuse? They were acting in the ignorance of the time. Magistrates at that time, magistrates, some didn't even get before judges sometimes. Magistrates were awarding a few months in prison for that heinous crime. I myself, in the 1980s, trained as a Samaritan. One of the things we were taught was how to handle it when we got callers uh, about child abuse. We were not taught then because they didn't know, that actually there was no way that somebody who abused would simply stop. And it was only in the mid-1990s, and don't I know it because I was in the Home Office at the time, that we actually introduced in this country a register of sex offenders. Do not expect the Catholic Church somehow, when that was the state uh, of knowledge at the time, uh, to have acted uh, in a unique and completely different way. In retrospect, yes, of course. In retrospect, yup. In retrospect, it should have done. So should the magistrates. So should, so should the Samaritans. So should the National Council of Civil Liberties. But when we ask who, whether the Catholic Church is a force for good, let's just try to imagine a world today without, for example, the billions of pounds that are poured into overseas aid by the Catholic Church, contributing year on year more than any single nation. Imagine the developing world had been left without the input of the medicine and the education that was brought to it by the missions. Imagine the absence of those collections Sunday upon Sunday for famine relief. Imagine the absence of the church in the local community. I know well that when I was in the Department of Employment and in the Home Office and we were setting up initiatives, single regeneration budget, whatever it might be, we relied on the church, a church as every bit as much as we relied on local councils uh, and on other organizations. We play 
a vital role. And you don't need to be a Catholic to acknowledge that we play that role. What is the church? It is its members. It is the nuns and the monks and the priests and the lay workers and the congregations. It is not just the hierarchy of the church. And I believe that the church to which I belong is a massive, massive force for good. But let us not just keep the debate at that level. I knew somehow that when we were here tonight, we would be discussing child abuse and condoms. They came in the end. I was almost thought we were going to get through an entire speech without condoms from Christopher Hitchens, but we got them at the end. <laughs> if he has a creed, it would be, I believe in condoms. So, but that, that is not what the Catholic Church is about. It isn't only about the physical relief of the poor. It isn't only about the work it does on earth, but it is the message that it preaches. And that message is one of hope. That message is one of salvation. And it is all very well for some people in intellectual arrogance to say, we can do without that. But actually billions of people across the world live by that message of hope and of salvation. They try to live by the commandments and also by the interpretation of those commandments by Christ. Yeah, sometimes they fail. Sometimes their leaders fail. Human beings do fail. But overwhelmingly, I say to you tonight with no apology or whatever, that a world without the Catholic Church would be poorer, would be more hopeless, and would be a worse place in which to live. Well, thank you very much indeed, Anne Widdicombe. And um, our final speaker is against the motion that the Catholic Church is a force for good in the world. He's the actor, broadcaster, and author, Stephen Fry, a bit of an all-rounder, really. Stephen can turn his hand to many things, very popular with his legions of fans. Stephen, let's hear your views, see how well you're doing the popularity stakes with uh, people in the Vatican. Oh, Gwendolyn remarked in The Importance of Being Earnest, when it becomes more than a moral duty to speak one's mind, it becomes a pleasure. And <laughs> this is one such occasion with my trusty hitch by my side. I am very proud to be here, but also very nervous, very worried. I've been nervous all day, and the reason I've been nervous is quite simple, and that is that this motion matters to me. It matters to me greatly. It's not a joke, it's not a game, it's not just a debate. I genuinely believe that the Catholic Church is not, to put it at its mildest, a force for good in the world. And therefore it is important for me to try and marshal my facts as well I can to explain why I think that. But I want first of all to say that I have no quarrel and no argument and I wish to express no contempt for individual devout and pious members of that church. They are welcome to their sacraments, to their welcome to their reliquaries and to their Blessed Virgin Mary. They're welcome to their, um, to their faith, to the importance they place in it, to the comfort and the joy that they receive from it. All of that is absolutely fine by me. It would be impertinent and wrong of me to express any antagonism towards any individual who wishes to find salvation in whatever form they wish to express it. That to me is sacrosanct as much as any article of faith is sacrosanct to anyone of any church or any faith in the world. It's very important. It's also very important to me, as it happens, um, that I have my own beliefs. Uh, they are a belief in the Enlightenment. They are a belief 
um, in the eternal adventure of trying to discover moral truth in the world. Discover. It's a terribly important word to which we might return. It's a fight. It's an empirical fight. It's one that was begun in the middle of, uh, of, of the last millennium. Uh, it's given the name the Enlightenment. And there is nothing, sadly, that the Catholic Church and its hierarchs likes to do more than to attack the Enlightenment. It did so at the time. Reference was made to Galileo and the fact that he was tortured for trying to explain the Copernican theory of the universe. That's history. History, as Miss Whittacombe has reminded us, is irrelevant. It's not important. All that matters now is that billions of pounds go out of this extraordinary institution to relieve the poor around the world and make the world a better place. History is of no importance whatsoever. Well, I beg to differ. History, history whinnies and quivers and vibrates in all of us in this hall, in this square mile. Let's think about this square mile. I'll come back to it in a moment. But first, Christopher made mention of limbo. It seems so tedious and so silly. One of those little casuistic games that Thomists and others play. Aquinas and Augustine of Hippo both proposed this extraordinary idea that babies who were unbaptized would not know heaven. They also proposed the idea of purgatory, which doesn't exist in the Bible. There's absolutely no evidence for it. However, what an extraordinary, brilliant coup to imagine such a thing as purgatory, that a soul needs to be prayed for in order to go to heaven, in order to turn left when he enters the aeroplane of heaven and get a first-class seat. <laughs> that he needs to be prayed for, and for many hundreds, indeed over a thousand years, you'll be amazed what generous terms those prayers came at. Sometimes as little or as two-thirds of a year's salary could ensure that a dead loved one would go to heaven. And money could ensure that your baby, your dead child, your dead uncle, your dead mother could go to heaven. And if you were rich enough, you could have a chantry built and monks would permanently sing prayers so that that existence in heaven for the child would go up and up and up until they were at the table of the Lord themselves. Now all this is in the past and is irrelevant. I see to Anne Widdicombe how irrelevant it is, except in one thing. This church is founded on the principle of intercession. Only through the apostolic succession, only through the laying on of hands from this Galilean carpenter whom we can all admire, only from the laying on of hands to his apostles, to St. Peter, to the other bishops, all the way down to everyone consecrated in this room, anyone ordained here will know they, are, uh, they have this extraordinary power to change the molecules of wine into blood, literally, to change the molecules of paste bread into flesh, literally, and to forgive the sins of the peasants and the poor whom they routinely exploit around the planet. Only this church has this extraordinary principle that it is through these male priests, and only male priests, that this is given. It is a doctrinal fact. It is more than a doctrinal fact. It is a dogma. Extra ecclesiam nulla salus. Outside the church, there is no salvation. That is a dogma of the church that has been used to excuse all the missionary zeal all the rape and torture of the Aztecs and the Incas, all the horrors of South America and Africa and the Philippines and the rest of the world, to which other churches and other cultures have also their guilt to admit. It's not unique to the Catholic Church, and I never said it was, and the motion doesn't say it was, or at least the opposition of the motion does not arrogate to the Catholic Church uniquely this sin. However, the particular nature of the exploitation of the poor, the vulnerable, and the young. If I were to talk to a priest now, believe me, that priest would be the most worldly, charming, self-deprecating, snobbish in a Ronald Knox, Alfred Gilby sort of way. <laughs> ah, ha, ha. He would be lovely. He would smoke. Gosh, how daring. <laughs> he would be a sort of ha-ha-ha priest. And uh, the superstition and the nonsense that we read about of the church 
it, it's absolute. Don't pay any attention, Stephen. Just join Farm Street or, one, or, the, or the Brompton Oratory and have a marvellous time as a Catholic, and everything is lovely and splendid. But be poor and ignorant, and my goodness me, every single detail of damnation and original sin and of any possibility of your complaining or asking to think for yourself. I said, let's think of this square mile. Just imagine in this square mile how many people were burned for reading the Bible in English. And one of the principal burners and torturers of those who tried to read the Bible in English here in London was Thomas More. You may know if you've read the novel Wolf Hall, which won the Man Booker Prize just the other day. Now, that's a long time ago. It's not relevant, except that it was only last century that Thomas More was made a saint, and it was only in the year 2000 that the last pope, the Pole, he, he made Thomas More the patron saint of politicians. <laughs> this is a man who put people on the rack for daring to own a Bible in English. He tortured them for owning a Bible in their own language. The idea that the Catholic Church exists to disseminate the word of the Lord is nonsense. It is the only owner of the truth for the billions that it likes to boast about. Because those billions are uneducated and poor, as again it likes to boast about. But they are the ones it can tell and bully and domineer. And then we come to children. Well, it's all very well to say the world didn't know better. The world had no knowledge of how dangerous, crime, uh, how dangerous a crime child abuse was. I want to read you some of the words of Ratzinger, the current pope. Staggers me to admit that he is the head of state of a country. Incidentally, Anne Whittacombe said, we didn't have the power of a nation state. Yes, you do. You are a nation state. Yes, I wrote it down. You mentioned that. You are a nation state. And it is no accident that the Cairo, the UN Cairo Population Conference, when they were trying to do something about the world's population spinning out of control, Vatican City, as a nation state represented at that conference, made a joint statement with the Islamic countries of the world, notably the most extreme Islamic countries of the world, led by Saudi Arabia, and it, it began on behalf of the revealed religions of the world, dot, 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 and what it did was essentially hobble and veto any possibility of women's sexual freedom in the world, because as we know, the Islamic religion and the Catholic Church have never been anything other than implacably opposed to women's choice in their own bodies and their destinies. <laughs> However, So, Ratzinger, in 2003, was, he, was, he was prefect, I, I'm not making this up, he was prefect of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. And it was his job to deal with the child abuse scandal that was brewing. His first act was to write a letter to Catholic bishops ordering them on pain of excommunication not to talk to the police or anyone else. Investigations should be handled, he wrote, and I'm quoting that letter, in the most secretive way, restrained by perpetual silence. The Mexican founder of the Legion of Christ movement, Maciel de Goyado, was protected from his own catalogue of child abuse, which is horrific. One cannot put on trial so close a friend of the Pope, said Ratzinger. When the allegations could no longer be denied, Maciel was sentenced sentenced to a life of prayer and penitence. <laughs> and Ratzinger described the whole affair and that of Bernard Law of Boston, to which my colleague also referred, uh, as causing suffering for the church and for me personally. He also said the answer would be to stop homosexuals from being allowed into the church. Now, it's perhaps unfair of me as a gay man to moan this enormous institution, which is the largest and most powerful church on earth, has over a billion, as they like to tell us, members, each one of whom is uh, under uh, strict instructions to believe the dogmas of the church, but may wrestle with them personally, of course. 
It's a little hard for me to know that I am disordered, or again, to quote Ratzinger, um, that I am guilty of a moral evil uh, simply by fulfilling my sexual destiny as I see it. It's, it's hard for me to be told that, to be told that I'm evil, because I think of myself as someone who is filled with love, whose only purpose in life was to achieve love, and who feels love for so much of nature and the world and for everything else, and who, like anybody decent and of an education, realizes that in order to achieve and, and receive love, it's a struggle. It's not one that needs a pope to tell you how to do it. It certainly isn't one who needs a pope to tell you that you're evil. With 6% of all teenage suicides being gay teenage suicides, we certainly don't need the stigmatization, the victimization that leads to the playground bullying when people say you're a disordered, morally evil individual. That's not nice. It isn't nice. The kind of cruelty in Catholic education, the kind of child, let's not call it child abuse, it was child rape. The kind of child rape that went on systematically for so long. Let's imagine that we can overlook this and say it is nothing whatever to do with the structure and nature of the Catholic Church and the twisted, neurotic and hysterical way that its leaders are chosen. The celibacy, the nuns, the monks, the priesthood. This is not natural and normal, ladies and gentlemen, in 2009. It really isn't. I'm sorry. For me to be called a pervert by these extraordinarily sexually dysfunctional people, I don't think human history has ever had more. I have, to, I have to say, this is not a problem that necessarily is permanent. I like to believe that in 10 years' time I could come back and argue the opposite. Even though I've talked about the history and the structural problems of this benighted institution and the cruelty and the unpleasantness it has caused around the world, I have yet to approach one of the subjects dearest to my heart. I've made three documentary films on the subject of AIDS in Africa. My particular love is the country of Uganda. It's one of the countries I love most in the world. Been there many times. I've interviewed Joseph uh, Yoweri Museveni and his wife Janet uh, before, unfortunately, she suddenly saw God. Um, there was a period when Uganda had the worst incidence of HIV AIDS in the world. I went to Rakai, the village where it was first spotted. But through an amazing initiative called ABC, abstinence, be faithful, correct use of condoms. Those three, I'm not denying that abstinence is a very good way of not getting AIDS. It really is, it works. It, so does being faithful, but so do condoms. And do not deny it. And this Pope, this Pope, not satisfied, not satisfied with saying, condoms are against our religion, please consider First, abstinence. Second, being faithful to your partner. He spreads the lie that condoms actually increase the incidence of AIDS. He actually makes sure that aid is conditional on saying no to condoms. I have been to, there's a hospital in Bwindi in the west of Uganda where I do quite a lot of work. It is unbelievable, the pain and suffering you see. Now, yes, yes it is true, abstinence will stop it. It's, it's the strange thing about this church. It is obsessed with sex, absolutely obsessed. Now they will say, they will say we with our permissive society and our rude jokes are obsessed. No, we have a healthy attitude. We like it, it's fun, it's jolly. Because it's a primary impulse, it can be dangerous and dark and difficult. It's a bit like food in that respect, only even more exciting. The only people who are obsessed with food are anorexics, and the morbidly obese. And that, in erotic terms, is the Catholic Church in a nutshell. So, all I want to say, really, is that we're here in the Methodist Hall. 
I'm not trying to argue against religion on this occasion. I'm not saying there's any... I understand the desire of anybody to, to seek spiritual rewards in a, in a complex and difficult to understand world. We don't know why we're here, where we're going. We want answers. We love the idea of answers. How marvelous it would be. But there are other choices. There are Quakers. Who could possibly quarrel with a Quaker? With their pacifism, with their openness, with their ease, with their simplicity, with their refusal to tell anybody what's a dogma and what isn't, even with Methodists also. I'm not saying Protestantism is the answer against Catholicism. I am merely saying there are all kinds of ways we can search for the truth. You do not need this imperial panoply of marble and gold. Do you know who would be the last person ever to be accepted as a prince of the church? The Galilean carpenter, that Jew. They would kick him out before he tried to cross the threshold. He would be so ill at ease in the church. That simple and remarkable man, if he said the things that he was said to have said, what would he think? What would he think of St. Peter's? What would he think of the wealth and the power and the self-justification and the wheedling apologies? What would he think? of a man who calls himself the father, a celibate who dared to lecture people on what family values are. What would he think of any of that? He would be horrified. But there is a solution. There is an answer. There is redemption available for all of us and any one of us. And for the Catholic Church, funnily enough, I think it's a novel by Maurice West. The Pope could decide that all this power, all this wealth, this hierarchy of princes, and bishops and archbishops and priests and monks and nuns could be sent out in the world with money and art treasures to put them back in the countries that they once raped and violated, whose original systems of animism and belief and simplicity they told would tell them, take them straight to hell. They could give that money away and they could concentrate on the apparent essence of their belief. And then I would stand here and say the Catholic Church may well be a force for good in the world. But until that day, it is not. Thank you. Fry, thank you very much. So you've heard all our four speakers. It's going to be your turn, the audience, next. And um, I'll give you a couple of minutes to um, think about what you want to um, ask our panellists, any questions or com comments you may wish to make. Because I'm going to give you now the result of that vote that you um, all gave when you were coming in here to Central Hall. And there are about 2,100 people in the auditorium today, well over that, actually. And this is how you all voted. Now, probably no surprise, because you can kind of tell from the applause that we've been getting from our speakers, just perhaps where you all stand. But this is how you actually voted. The Catholic Church, the motion is, the Catholic Church is a force for good in the world. In favor of the motion were 678. 678 agree with that. Against the motion that the Catholic Church is a force for good was 1,102. Big difference. However, 346 of you were undecided. Now, I've been taxing my arithmetical abilities here, and I see that it's a difference of 424. 346 were undecided, so Archbishop and Anne Widdicombe, you're going to have to not over win over the undecided, but actually convert some from the other side. So you need to get 425 over to win the motion, because at the moment you're uh, quite a few hundred mm -hmm. behind. Let's see if we can uh, sway any opinions here amongst all of you by listening to some points that uh, you wish to raise with the panel. And then we're going to ask you to vote again, and I'm going to ask our speakers to make their closing statements. 
Now, put your hand up if you want to speak. If you go on, I've got a little button here that will render you inaudible. So please keep your comments to the point. You're standing, sir, so you must be terribly keen and enthusiastic. So I will come to you first. And say your name and designation if you wish to, if you think it may be relevant. And I've just come back from the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva, where I put to the United Nations Human Rights Council the fact that the Holy See, its alter ego of the Catholic Church, has, been, uh, has broken five articles of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Just one of those, because it's supposed to produce annual reports and it's 12 years behind in doing those. It did not deny, the, the Holy See came back uh, and did not deny any of the charges that I made uh, on the 22nd of September. Okay. Um, all it said... You're yeah. losing us, you're losing us. What is your point, please? My, my point is that it did not deny breaking five articles of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child on Child Abuse. And I think it's disgraceful that it should be allowed to do it and that the international community should let it get away with it. Okay, thank you. We'll take another question. Uh, there's a lady here. Um, I would like to ask Mr. Hutchins if he is only against the Catholic Church or against all religions. <laughs> That's would you, is is this, shall I go to the podium? I'm just going to take one more. Okay. No, just stay here. I think I heard. Um, okay, anybody upstairs? Can I see? I'm sorry, the lights are in my eye. Hi there. Um, this is a question for Christopher Hitchens. Um, many people today feel that we're really living in some kind of moral crisis, and you can see that all around us. Now, if one thing that the Catholic Church does do for good, in my opinion, is give us the Ten Commandments, a very basic, obvious way of giving us some kind of moral guidance, would you not agree with that? Okay, well, let's, let's just get a response here from, uh, from our panel. So, Ten Commandments, Christopher Hitchens, that question was directed to you. I don't think the Catholic Church has a monopoly on the Ten Commandments, I but know. nevertheless, <laughs> um, do you... Uh, oh, is this on? It is on, just stay. Um, am I audible? Yeah. The, the lady in front began by asking me, do I reserve this uh, condemnation only for the Holy Roman Church, and not for other Catholics, for example, like Byzantine Catholics and Protestants and so on? I, I think they're all uh, the same equivalent glimpses of the identical untruth. Um, and I might use my answer to just say something about Anne Whittacombe. I knew we wouldn't get through without talk about uh, money being given away on, on supposedly humanitarian projects in the third world. You never don't get that. You never get the admission that it's done to proselytize for religion either, which my friends at Made the Science Sans Frontier Doctors Without Borders, for example, or Amnesty International don't do. They don't proselytize. They do it for the sake of their fellow creatures. But if I'm debating with a Mormon and I say, are you serious? Joseph Smith got a special revelation on plates of gold in upstate New York, and I ridicule the absurd absurdity of the Church of Latter-day Saints, he's going to say to me, boy, you should see our missionaries in Bolivia, though. It's always the same. Are you going to grant this to Hamas? The whole claim of Hamas and Islamic Jihad in Gaza is they provide social services. Is this claim valid for them too? What nonsense. No. The proper study of mankind is man and the proper application of humanitarianism is humanistic in my judgment. Now of the commandments, the first, I, haven't, I, don't, I can't list them exactly in order, I have them in my head. The first two or three are entirely about fearing the author of the orders. <laughs> Entirely about being terrified of someone who you're enjoined to love. I don't know about you, ladies and gentlemen, but the idea of compulsory love has always struck me as a bit shady. Especially <laughs> if you're, in, you're ordered to love someone who you absolutely must fear. So the first three are, look out for me and keep at least one day of mine where you'll right. be terrified full time. Wait a second. Well, it is Ten Commandments, darling. All right, yes, I know, but I do want to give the other side a chance to come in. Okay. Have you made your point there? I okay, understand. Anne Whittacombe, Ten Commandments, firm bedrock of moral teaching. Uh, yes, but as uh, Christopher Hitchens took the opportunity to reply to a point I'd made, uh, I'm going to take the opportunity to reply to a point that uh, Stephen made. 
uh, which is very simply this. He says the church is obsessed with sex. No, its critics are obsessed with sex. There's no sex in the creed. There's no sex in the Lord's Prayer. There's no sex in the liturgy. But when the critics start on the Catholic Church, all they can talk about is sex, but of sex more later. Uh, if we can come to the, uh, the Ten Commandments, I would have thought it quite obvious that the Ten Commandments set out a blueprint for a moral and successful society. Let us just look at some of them. Honour thy father and thy mother. Think of today's disrespect. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, and thou shalt not covet. Tell that to the bankers with their bonuses. I actually think that if you look at the moral precepts of the Ten Commandments, they're as relevant now as they were then. Okay. Archbishop, do you want to come in briefly on this? And that point about the rights of the child, I mean, that, that's something that's come up quite a bit. Well, first of all, the... United Nations conventions that he's talking about, uh, they need to be well understood. And it is a fact that there is not a unanimity even in the interpretation of the content and the meaning of many of those conventions is referring to. I am not particularly personally conversant with the issues he is raising, the five accusations that he has laid against uh, the Holy See, but I'm sure that the permanent observer of the Holy See in Geneva would have given adequate answer to his question. As for defense of children, as for the defense of children, taking care of children, I think we don't have to go to the United Nations to learn about that. Oh, by the way, the Ten Commandments are in the Bible, but my father knew it before he became a Christian. All African religions recognized those basic norms of morality. Everybody knows that. All right. Let's, let's take some more questions from the floor. Okay. Don't need, don't need the Bible for that. Chat there. Hi. Um, this is a very simple uh, question for Anne Widdicombe. Um, you might think it may be a naive question. If so, I'd be very happy to be educated. Um, why is it wrong for a woman to become a priest, but perfectly acceptable for a woman such as yourself to become an MP? Okay, yeah. thanks. We'll come to that in a moment. I think we're going to go just, just here next. Yeah. Hello. Um, it's a query, a query for Anne and the Archbishop. Uh, Anne raised a point regarding the billions that are poured into Africa for uh, famine relief, uh, aid and things like that. Um, she also mentioned uh, the billions that are raised in uh, collections. What is, what is the point there? Are you trying to say that the billions that are poured into Africa are raised by collections because we don't seem to see any dissolution of the wealth that is sat in the Vatican and in the palaces of the Vatican, and coupled with that, I respect your faith, I respect the message you give, but why to pass that message on do you need the finery that you wear? Do you need the palace of the Vatican? Okay. Point made. Um, I think we're going to go here. Yeah. Hello. Uh, my name is Matthew Hampton, and I've got a brief question for the Archbishop. Sorry, can you hear me? No. Now we can. Start again. Oh, thank goodness. Uh, Archbishop, of which current Roman Catholic policy are you most ashamed? Which current Catholic policy are you most ashamed of? I'll repeat it. Okay, let's, let's stick with the Archbishop on that. So, Archbishop, which current Catholic policy, this question is, are you most ashamed of? I don't know whether you're serious in that question, or you just want to... Uh, provoke because if it all our, our Catholic policies are not just dreamt overnight by the Pope or anybody if it is a Catholic policy it is reasonable it is by, it is based on our traditions and scriptures and there's none about which I'm ashamed if that is the answer to your question okay and the other question about 
I think the Vatican, the Vatican is worth something like, is it two and a half billion dollars it has? I mean, it invests it all over the place and so on. Do you need all that money? Was that question up there, all the finery and all the rest of it? I was trying to listen. I couldn't quite his get... Question, well, his question was, you talked about the billions in aid that goes to Africa, dispensed by, by Catholic organisations one way or another, but what about the wealth of the Vatican itself? Do you need all that money? Uh, if, if it means that they should carry St. Peter's Basilica to Africa, that will not, that's not the answer. Uh, and I don't know what billions of, uh, that he says the Vatican has. The billions of this world, I think, are not in the Vatican. We know where they are, and they are not coming to Africa. On the contrary, Africa has been sucked dry by those people, those multinationals. They are the ones who should be bringing them, our money back to us. You, I think we are, we are targeting the wrong place. I come from Africa, and uh, the funds that come from church agencies for us are very important. We know that normally in most of those are countries, we don't really, we are not, we don't, we are not, we, we should not even be looking up to people to help us. We should be helping ourselves and we are working towards that. And would you come one specific question to you? Yeah. Why not women priests in the Catholic Church? Well, no, the specific question was, why is it not all right for a woman to be a priest, but it is for a woman to be an MP? That exactly. was the specific question. All right. Uh, and I have to say to you, I mean, that really does betray a vast ignorance. <laughs> a member of parliament, male or female, does not stand in persona Christi at the point of consecration. The church is not about careers. The church is about vocations and about theology. And I do not believe it possible for a woman at the point of consecration, woman's ministry is different. This is specific to the priesthood. and probably won't be understood uh, by a lot of the people who don't understand the theology of the priesthood. Mm. But I don't believe that it is any more possible for a woman to represent Christ at the point of consecration than for a man to be the Virgin Mary. Okay, thanks. Lots of... Very good. Lots of hands up, and I really do want to go around everybody. So, panel, if you could keep your responses to the point as much as you can. Up there, please. Question to Anne and the Archbishop. How can the church possibly sustain and justify taking money from the impoverished in Mexico, in Latin America, in Africa, and at the same time suggesting that you're a force for good? Okay, thanks. Well, a uh, question to Stephen Fry. I'm a Catholic, but I, I like you a lot. <laughs> and then, about, I don't know that the Catholic Church condemns homosexuality as such, only recommends chastity for everybody. <laughs> and then, if I am not married, I should be chaste, either I am homosexual or heterosexual. And also, <laughs> as I have read in your books, uh, you should not, or you, not, you don't consider that to be celibate for a long period is something so awful or impossible. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, thank you. Now, okay, did I say that? Yeah. I missed that. Hi, uh, question for Anne Widdicombe, actually. You accused Christopher Hitchens of judging the Catholic Church by the standards of the time, but surely the truths in your doctrines are either eternal or they're not. Okay. I'll just take one more there and then we'll come. Yeah, go on. Uh, my, hello. My name is Jeremy Drax. I was baptized Church of England and I'm now in the Church of Rome. Of all the speakers here tonight, I endorse 100% what Stephen Fry has said. In our church, we do not reject anyone. The life of Christ was a life of service, a life of sacrifice, and a life of generosity. He did not spend it with the rich, the powerful, those with nice clothes and refinery. He spent it with the down and outs, the poor, the sick, those who were rejected by society. It is a tragic shame that a church that is founded on such fabulous principles has lost its way in my professional view and personal view in buildings that are arguably excessive to its requirements with cardinals and bishops who, 
with Christ's guidance, okay. should be on yeah. the shop floor yeah. serving the people. All right. You've had this. Therefore, why is this church not leading by example and following okay. the life of Christ? All right, thanks. You're reading a statement there. Okay, fine. Uh, Stephen Fry. Stephen Fry, the question about the Catholic Church apparently doesn't condemn homosexuality, that question asked. Uh, well, I'm afraid it simply does. Um, it, it does condemn it, yes. It calls it a, the, the official word is disorder, but it was refined by the current pontiff, Ratzinger, who called it a moral evil. But on the other hand, we must remember, as the point that was made, is that the church is very loose on moral evils because although they try to accuse people like me who believe in the empiricism and the enlightenment of somehow what they call moral relativism, as if it's some appalling sin, where what it actually means is thought, um, they, um, they, for example, thought that slavery was perfectly fine. Absolutely okay, and then they didn't. They thought until the year 2000 that a baby went to limbo, causing unbelievable distress to parents whose child died. Okay. Unbelievable distress. And then, with a wave of the hand and a stamp of a seal, it was no longer true. Something that had been eternally, or at least true for 2,000 years, suddenly wasn't. Because the truth is complicated. It's hard. And what is the point of the Catholic Church if it says, oh, well, we couldn't know better because nobody else did? Then what are you for? Okay. Oh, and the, yeah, and the question about the turn and the as well, if you could, yeah. I think it is high time, I didn't want to get into too much theology tonight, but I think it's high time that this uh, interpretation of limbo by Stephen Fry was questioned. <laughs> now, I actually went to a Catholic school, I absorbed Catholic doctrine, I was certainly taught about limbo, and I don't actually recognize Stephen's description of it. Because it, was, it wasn't for all eternity, what limbo was was simply, and I do appreciate that to most people this won't matter, but it, it just needs answering. What limbo was, was straightforwardly a place where they waited for the second coming. That is all. It's a long wait. Long wait, yeah, okay. long wait. And long Archbishop, maybe, wait, can you just clarify for us on this thing about homosexuality? <laughs> the Catholic Church condemns the act but not the individual. Did Jesus Christ himself actually say anything about homosexuality? Uh, <laughs> I don't think he did. Uh, that is a wrong question in this regard. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, because, no, because uh, the, we are not aware about homosexuality, the morality of homosexuality being a matter that drew the attention of Jesus. Uh, but this, Jesus certainly spoke about about the Ten Commandments and adultery. But to come to the position of the Church of Homosexuality, we, uh, it, it recognizes there are, some, there are people who have homosexual tendencies and they even consider themselves as such. But we, we are not, it, it, and it, the Church also says that the homosexual acts are wrong, but that doesn't mean that those who are engaged in it are condemned outright because each person has his own personal story. There is room for that. Uh, and uh, I do not think we should deny the church the right to propound its own doctrines. You are not obliged to take let's, it. Let's hear some more from the floor. I'm sorry about the question about eternal truth. We may get to that a little later. Okay, over there, up there. It actually Can't follows on from the point just raised. As a gay man, I find the history of sexual repression and oppression that's gone on in the church to be argued that that's just being um, con being obsessed by sex to be a bit offensive and I wondered if right. Anne Whitcomb would defend her position a little bit more on sexuality. We've had, the, we've had that point. We've, 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 ra we've dealt with that point. Can I go to number two? Um, I just wanted to say on behalf of myself and my fellow degenerates that uh, I would just like to ask all the Catholics in the room as well as the uh, proposing team okay. if they'd like to just stay out of my sex life and in my bedroom. All right. That'd be great. We've had, we've had this. Okay. This is can we have slightly different points, perhaps, that haven't been raised? Yeah. Let's see if I've got any luck with you. Yes. Um, hello. Um, this is a point specifically to the Archbishop. He um, spoke about his father and how before becoming a Christian, his father had a basic grasp of the Ten Commandments uh, from the society that he lived within. Um, he seemed to use this as a point um, to um, prop up his own argument. 
I would argue the contrary. Surely, if people have a grasp of basic morality without the dogma, the doctrine of the church, then everything good, all the humanitarian aid, all the great work that the church has been doing that you've spoken about, surely that's not the church. That's just people that right. happen to be under this umbrella of the church. It's the people okay. that are doing it, not the dogma of the church. Fine. Here. I'm going to take that as a point rather than a, a question. Could, the, the young lady with the spectacles, yeah. Yeah, talking about um, sort of the humanitarian aspect of what's done, I was just wondering if uh, Stephen Fry and Christopher Hitchens felt that perhaps there would still be the same amount of aid and the st same amount of con concern for sort of, uh, you know, people in Africa that do need our help without sort of this emotional, spiritual blackmail <laughs> that perhaps the Catholic Church can be guilty of. Okay, we'll come to that. Any supporters of the Catholic Church? Because so many of you, sorry, I'm not showing bias, but just to spice things up. Gentle, uh, wait till the microphone gets to you. At, yeah. At the front, she's not put her hand up. I sit here, I'm, I'm looking at the word intelligence. And I think behind the word intelligence is reason. I thought that this discourse was going to be about intelligence and reason and not about emotion, whipping up emotions. I want to ask Hitchens and uh, Fry. You try to uh, put the blame of the Jewish Holocaust and the slave trade squarely on the shoulders of the church. Are you sure of that position? Okay. Just pass the microphone to the sister next to you, please, because I think you had your hand raised, and then we'll come to the panel. I am a reverend sister and a, a nun. I just want to say that uh, our life is based on uh, the life of Jesus Christ, not on uh, emotion or on based on the worldly, the way the world is going. So I thank all the people who are listening and the, I think the message we are getting here will lead us to live a good life. That's why me, myself, sitting here listening to the talk, I think it is good that we focus our attention on the life yeah. lived by our Lord okay. Jesus Christ Thank you. and what our Archbishop All right. tried Thank to you. Thank you, sister. teach us. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just take a couple more, actually, because so many hands in the air. Um, can we come... Yep, just take your pick at the front there. Can you keep your points very brief? Because really, you're I taking sh liberties too much, I, too Anne long. Whittem, Anne Whittingham said there was no sex in the Lord's Prayer. In the Sorry, world I inhabit, no you don't prayer. become a father without sex being involved. All right, we'll take that as a point, as a comment. <laughs> if you've got brief comments, okay, there. And then I'm going to come to the panel, don't worry. As is so often the case in these debates, uh, the devil lies in the interpretation of single words in the motion. And the word is good. And it is, I think one has to accept that if you have a billion followers, then it is an enormous force. But whether it's exercising its good now uh, or it should change, Stephen Fry left the door open to us to see that right. if the Curia and the Pope uh, uh, admit that there needs to be change, okay. then think we would, I think, vote okay. more favorably for the church. Okay, thanks. Let's just get through some more comments. Okay, yeah, briefly, please, briefly. Thank you. Uh, as somebody who spent 38 years of her life as a Catholic and then start saw the again, light. Start again, start again. No, no, we didn't hear. I spent 38 years of my life as a Catholic and then I saw the light. And um, my life now is going back and forth to Africa and next month I go to Uganda and I'm working on trying to stop mothers dying in pregnancy and childbirth. What I'm saying is, please, please, reverse the rule on condoms and family planning and contraception and right. save more lives. <laughs> save thousands and thousands of lives. We will do one briefly. No, we will. All of you. Because they need... Uh, uh, OK, where is the microphone? Three minutes. Microphones. Yeah. OK, just... Let's keep this moving. Briefly, please. 
Yes, very briefly, um, as a Catholic, I'm actually very pleased to be here this evening to hear two sides of a very important argument. And the positive thing I take away is that the Catholic Church can take the opportunity to reflect upon these comments and that we look for the future. And it's by actually accepting these comments and by looking for a way forward that the church can actually grow and have a more important part of the world. All right. Thank you. Up there. You're going to have to address some of these points in your closing statement. Oh, this is a question for Stephen and Christopher. I'm really happy that Stephen's mentioned the Enlightenment and empiricism, which is something that I, I, uh, I think can add a lot to, to human existence. And I'm just wondering um, what your thoughts on the, the monopoly of a certain type of, of sensation that religion seems to have on the, you know, the existence of God is obviously put down to a particular sensationary experience and also the, the further impingement that religion is having upon empiricism in particularly um, the United States on things like you know, intelligent design okay. and these arguments. Thank yep, you. Yeah, briefly. Okay, very, very quickly, like 15 seconds, everybody. Yeah. Where is the microphone? Just take it there. You don't have to stand in the middle. Um, just a question for the Archbishop. I'd like to know how, how you calculate the figure of how many people, how many Catholics there are in the world. I was baptised a Catholic. I'm now atheist. I, I, am, I presume it's done by baptism records, and I'm cal calculated as a Catholic. Okay. And why can I not now disassociate myself from the church? All right. I'm sorry, everybody. Can't really take any more questions. Can't take any more questions from the floor, really. But panel, what I propose is this. You've heard the points that are raised. Some of them are comments, some of them were questions, like the one specifically to you, Christopher Hitchens, about the um, Holocaust. You're going to have a few minutes to make your closing statements. Please incorporate these questions that you heard in your closing statements. Because audience, I want you to vote again. You've heard the presentations, you've heard some of the, the responses and some of the points that have been raised by, by the audience here. So please do. Let me just remind you how you vote. Okay? If you are for the motion that the Catholic Church is a force for good in the world, then just tear this off and put it in the box. If you're against the motion that the Catholic Church is a force for good, rip this up, take the bit that's against and put that's in the box. If you're still undecided, then just put the whole ticket into the box. That's how to vote. Now, for those of you who are watching at home, if you'd like a briefing booklet on some of those issues that you've heard raised today, then please go to um, www.intelligencesquared.com and you can download that booklet. Anybody can do it and it's absolutely uh, free. Okay, so everybody is doing that. So while you're all doing that, it's going to take a little bit of time. We're going to hear the closing statements incorporating some of the points that you, the audience, raised. And we're going to do it in reverse order this time. And it's, um, it's going to be Stephen Fry first. Let me just remind you about some of the points, or did you make notes I, about I've them? Made notes, yeah. You've made notes. Excellent chap, Stephen. You, you're doing the work. So, Stephen Fry, final statements, Thank please. You. Oh, stay sitting. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Obser observant chap, aren't I? Yes. Um, well, it's been a really interesting debate, and I, I, I love, I've loved some of the questions from the floor. Um, I suppose I'm slightly disappointed that uh, Anne Whittingham in particular should say, oh, I knew they'd bring up condoms and child rape and yeah. homosexuality. It's a bit like a burglar in court, so you would bring up that burglary and that manslaughter. You never mention the fact I'd give my father a birthday present. You know, it's, yes. Yes, are you getting the message? There is a reason we hammer home these issues, because they matter. They matter to people's hearts and souls. I make no apology to the lady who said this is supposed to be intelligence squared. Why are you being so emotional? We're talking about religion and souls here. I make no apology for being emotional about that subject. I make no apology for apparently not understanding the theology of Thomas Aquinas and Augustine of Hippo or the Council of Trent, or various other extraordinary conventions that ruled on limbo. Don't tell me there's some magisterial and mystical reason behind limbo that I'm too stupid to understand. That's not good enough. It really isn't. As, um, as, as a, rather more, a rather more contemporary theologian, Bultmann, said, the problem with mysticism is it begins in mist and ends in schism. And um, 
It's terribly disappointing to hear that those who, who want to stand up for a church that is based on a founder who was put to death by capital punishment, who for all we know from what he said seemed to be very, very understanding, imaginative, pure, simple, remarkably intelligent in a Socratic kind of way, and he is represented by really I'm afraid pretty low rent intelligences and pretty low rent imaginations. They are not connected at the moment, it seems to me, with the aspirations and desires of the human race. There's such an opportunity owning a billion souls at baptism that can never be unowned, to answer that lady's question, until she's excommunicated. So yes, you are counted. Um, it's such an opportunity to do something remarkable to make this planet better. And it's an opportunity that is constantly and arrogantly being avoided. And I'm sorry for that. Okay, thank you. Final statement from Conservative MP Anne Whittacombe for the motion that the Catholic Church is a force for good in the world. Right, can I first <clears throat> answer the point raised by the lady over there about how she'd been uh, helping women uh, who uh, were in danger of death even uh, from uh, pregnancy and childbirth and answer the uh, allegation behind it which is that somehow the reason why so many uh, women in the third world uh, continue uh, to go on having children beyond a safe point is all because it's the wicked Catholic Church. Let me point out the obvious that if you're in a country where the mortality rate is extremely high where you do not expect the majority of your children to survive into adulthood, and there is no convenient abbey field to nip to, the reason that you have children is for security in your old age. And in case anybody thinks I'm making that up, may I point out that I did actually go out with an aid project to Zambia, and I asked woman after woman about why they had such large families when they couldn't feed them, and the answer was always the same. Somebody has got to look after me when I am old. Don't let's forget that. And then, of course, we have had all the usual stuff about how uh, the Catholic Church, uh, being against condoms, has apparently caused untold misery. I'm not going to cite the Catholic Church now. I'm going to cite people who wouldn't want to be associated with the Catholic Church. Dr. Edward Green, liberal agnostic. Harvard Center for Population and Development Studies writes, 20 years into the pandemic, there is no evidence that more condoms leads to less AIDS. We're simply not seeing what we expected. And he goes on to say that in Africa, where many have to go miles even to get an aspirin, a number of researchers are now questioning whether the universal ideal of perfect condom use, because, that's not, because that is what is required, uh, with a regular supply is quite simply unattainable. John Richens of the Center for Sexual Health and HIV Research says, we should ask why condom promotion is apparently not having much effect in most developing countries. And finally, Dr. Trevor Stammers, none of these people Catholics. There are no examples to date from any country in the world that has reversed a generalized epidemic by means of condom promotion alone. Now, if we are true to wanting to help people, if we are really true to it, then we should face up to that perhaps rather inconvenient fact that what was expected hasn't actually happened. I could go on, I could quote UNAIDS, I could quote the Wellcome Trust, research after research now, suggesting that condoms actually are, are not the answer that they were once thought to be. And when I said that our opponents are obsessed with sex, I meant it in this way. The only nastiness tonight, and there's been virtually none, the only nastiness tonight came when Stephen Fry accused the Archbishop of being sexually dysfunctional <laughs> because he said that celibate priests and monks had no right to tell him what to do because they were, and I quote his words, sexually dysfunctional. As I've said, 
our opponents always try to home in on sex when the teachings of the church, which are after all only about the stability of family, the maintenance of fidelity, the virtue of chastity, when the church teaches that as one part of all its teaching, I do sometimes despair at the way that these debates always, always come back to that. So I'm very pleased to have been here tonight, despite the fact that I think the incoming poll was slightly discouraging. Uh, I'm very pleased to have been here, to have been here with the Archbishop and with the two gentlemen opposite, and thank you for the opportunity. Okay. Against the motion, Christopher Hitchens. Um, those who ask uh, confessions from other people should be willing to make one oneself. I am obsessed with sex. <laughs> <laughs> Ever since I discovered that my God-given male member was going to give me no peace, I decided to give it no rest in return. <laughs> <laughs> Seems fair to me. Now, two people asked me to be very quick and do world poverty and the Holocaust, and I, I'll do that. There is only one cure to, for world poverty that's ever been found or ever will be, and it's very simple. It's, and it can be phrased very simply too. It's called the empowerment of women. Go to Bangladesh or Bolivia. I have to ask you to hold your applause, though I love you. Um, go to Bangladesh or Bolivia, give women control over their reproductive cycle, uh, give them a, throw in a handful of corn if you can, uh, make them not just the, the beasts of burden and the beasts of childbearing that they become, and the floor will rise, it just will. It never fails anywhere. Against this one solution, the Catholic Church has set its face. The efforts of the missionary church in the third world mean more people die, not less. It's as simple as that. More famine, more disease, more ignorance, more random and avoidable death. To the Holocaust, sir. That the church preached that the Jewish people were collectively responsible for the death of Christ until 1964, until nearly 20 years after the Nuremberg trials, may or may not have something to do with the availability of a reservoir of anti-Jewish hatred in countries like Poland, Spain, Italy, Germany, Austria, and elsewhere. I think it does have something to do with it, okay? Um, the Ten Commandments, three of them are awe-inspiring. They're about being afraid of a totalitarian figure. Three of them are ordinary morality. We know of no code of ethics ever found, that, and the Archbishop bears me out on this, that recommends murder, um, theft, or perjury. Uh, putting adultery on the same level as that um, may not be morally advisable. Um, saying that covetousness should uh, be considered in the same light as a, as a crime, in other words, a thought crime, you're condemned now for something you're thinking, and it may be something that leads you to enterprise and emulation. That's forbidden too. That's very, very iffy, it seems to me, and there's a very iffy part of it which lumps those you mustn't covet in with the animals and the chattels and your property, and those who it lumps in are your women folk. And do you, are you seriously expect to, to uh, be taken seriously if you say that that commandment that does re reduce women to beasts of burden and childbearers and chattel has nothing to do with the appalling position of women, not just in poorer societies but in ours as well. Again, for shame if you can feel it. Now, unanswered questions, amazing. I asked, where is cardinal law Bernard Law, and why? I have an authority here. He ducks the question. Um, Anne Whittacombe, um, sorry, I've got one more thing to say about that. Um, he also says that the church advises against homosexuality. It teaches against it. No, it doesn't. Any more than it teaches against divorce or contraception. Where it can, it bans these things and punishes them and writes them into the criminal code. If all you were doing, sir, ma'am, were offering advice, we could probably be fine with it. No one, though they were asked repeatedly, would say whether they thought Stephen Fry, my friend, was in a state of mortal sin or not. They wouldn't tell you. Something about the question brought out their inner coward. Well, I say that homosexuality is not just a form of sex, it's a form of love, and it deserves our respect for that reason. That if, if when, I, when my children were young, I'd have been proud to have Stephen as their babysitter, and I'd told them they were lucky. And if anyone came to my door as a babysitter wearing holy orders, I'd call first a cab and then the police. <laughs> and, and, 
And it's your fault, sir and ma'am, it's your fault that that's true and that everybody knows it's true. How you can live with it, I don't know. Now, relativism, I thought we were agreed. But Anne Whittacombe says slavery has to be considered in context. What's more relative than that? There were people at the time, Thomas Paine, Benjamin Franklin, there were innumerable humanists and secularists who said slavery is, is evil. The church wouldn't agree. Now, which is it then? Is it that the church is wrong or, even more suggestive, that God has not yet revealed that it's wrong to them? Or did God support it all, that, all those years and then change his mind? From a, from a beginning point of absurdity, you arrive at a terminal point of absolute moral chaos. And I think you've at least done us the favor of making that plain this evening. <laughs> God, in short, God did not make man in his own image. It is precisely to the contrary. Mammals and primates made many gods and many churches in their own rival images. And that would explain if these churches and faiths were invented by primates who were only half a chromosome away from a chimpanzee, which happens to be the case, it would explain a lot, would it not? Um, I can't offer you absolution. Not in my power to do it. Stephen can't offer you absolution. First of all, we think, we believe, we more or less know. There's no such thing. But if you confess your sins specifically, if you name them and don't just make them general, if you do so truly repenting of them, without any purpose of evasion, and if you make a firm purpose of amendment, you might be able, you might be able still, while there's time, to live with your consciences. I wish you all the luck in the world in pursuing that course of action. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Final statement from our final speaker, Archbishop of Abuja, John Onayaken. You've got to make your final pitch now to the audience. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to draw the attention of the audience back to the topic. Yeah. And the topic is quite clear. The Catholic Church is a force for good in the world. It did not say it is the only source for good. It did not say it has always been a source for good. It's not in the past tense, it's in the present tense. It is a source for good. The way I learned logic, this is the way I would proceed. Which is why when uh, we are being brought back to all the evils in the past, I kept asking myself, are my friends digging into all those because they really have no proper argument to, to say against the motion? Because from all they have said, I, can, I still have not seen how they have in any way shown that the Catholic Church is not a force for good in the world. There are other people, of course, who are forces for good in the world. We are just one of them. And I still believe that so we are. And I just want to bring that to the attention of this body, if at all it is possible. Because from what I'm saying, probably many are not really listening in that direction. But... But um, also what worries me a bit is uh, uh, the, the way the Catholic Church has been described from across this table. Uh, my sister, my, uh, Mrs. Wedderman already mentioned a few cases where there have been a clear caricature of both the Catholic Church and its position. If it is a caricature, uh, sometimes caricatures are very funny and they are quite entertaining, but I do not think we are here about entertainment. I think it is important, if this is a serious discussion, that you make, one makes a little effort to actually get to know, understand exactly the truth about the matter. We can, I can say all kinds of things about other people, but I think it is fair enough that um, when it comes to what does the church say about condoms, what does it say about homosexuality, what does we say about women, priests, we need to take the trouble to find, find out exactly what it is saying, not what the, the newspapers are saying that we are saying. Unfortunately, this is not a, a, a forum to give you a proper, a proper exposition of the Catholic faith. And in fact, I... I seriously resisted the temptation to preach to you. It seems that the, all the preaching today came from the other side. And, um, uh, but anyway, be that as it may, 
I have must mention two issues that was raised. Uh, we have been told that the whole genocide in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Rwanda is a fault of the Catholic Church because the Rwandans are practically all Muslims. If there's going to be a genocide, it has to be done by somebody. They happen to be Muslims. In any case, that a bishop was accused. Yes, a bishop was accused, but the bishop was discharged and acquitted because he was falsely accused. When he was accused, all the world, world, world media were there because this was, good, this was great news, a bishop accused of genocide. The day he was discharged and acquitted, they were not interested. Nobody was interested to hear that Bishop Augustine Misago has been discharged and acquitted because he was, he was accused on false, um, trumped up charges. As for condoms, <clears throat> um, Mrs. Weatherman already has shown that there are a scientific positions that support the position of the church. All I want to add here is this. If indeed the burden of HIV and AIDS is in Africa, know that it is my nephews, my nieces, who are most affected. And let nobody out there think that they care more about the life of my own nieces and nephews than I care. So if, I t if we take a position, it is because we seriously believe that this is the right position. We are not talking of the validity or the value of one sexual act with a good condom done properly. We are talking of condoms being distributed indiscriminately to young people and being told that once you wear this, you are safe. The fact is that when that is done, AIDS is increased, not decreased. I think you just, this is being proved from epidemiological research. It's not talking about whether one act, whether condom protects from one act, but when it comes to a whole lot of people, like the situation in, in most countries of Africa, and the, the situation of health services, right down to simple aspirin, then we know what we are talking about. Finally, we have, this, uh, this uh, event has been very useful, and very, I'm very happy. To, be, to have been here. Uh, we never said that the Catholic Church is perfect. Some questions were proposed to the Archbishop. I think about it. We continue to do our best to be as close as we can to Jesus Christ and his, what he wants us to be and to constantly be a force for good in the world. Right. And I thank you. Archbishop, thank you. You've all voted again. Now the moment of truth panel. Let me remind everybody that before the debate, when everybody came in, this is how you voted. For the motion that the Catholic Church is a force for good in the world, 678. Against the motion, 1,102. And the undecideds, the don't knows, were 346. This is how you voted subsequently. For the motion that the Catholic Church is a force for good, from 678, it's gone to 268. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Against the motion, it's now 1,876. And you can see that doesn't leave very many don't knows. It's 34 undecided. So, commiserations, Archbishop and Anne Widdicombe. Congratulations, Stephen Fry and Christopher Hitchens. Thank you all. If you want to know more about Intelligence Squared debates, then please do go to the website www.intelligencesquareddebates. From me, Zain Abidawi, goodbye. <laughs>
He also expressed sorrow about the murder and forced conversion of Serbian Orthodox Christians in the Balkans during the Second World War. And it doesn't end there. There are smaller but significant, um, equally significant, avowals of a very bad conscience. These have included uh, regret for the rape and the torture of orphans and other children in church-run schools in almost every country on earth, from Ireland to Australia. And I'm pleased to see that due reconsideration is now being given, and may in fact have been given, to the hellish, I choose the word carefully, doctrine of limbo, St. Augustine's uh, cruel and stupid disposal problem solution to a non-existent problem, that is to say, the destination of the souls of unbaptized children. Up until now, Catholic parents have been taught that's where their unbaptized children went, a form of torture that's sometimes worse than the physical. Now it seems that this piece of Augustinian sadism is undergoing reconsideration as well. But remember, this is from a church that, on the whole, cannot err. We still await a more direct admission. For example, I give some suggestions of my own while we're at it. I would like them to take back the Concordat made with Adolf Hitler, the first treaty he ever signed, giving the church a monopoly over education in Germany in exchange for the dis dissolution of the Catholic Center Party to give the Nazi Party a clear run. I'd have apologized for the Lateran Pact with Mussolini, myself, also the first treaty ever signed by that fascist dictator. I would also think I'd want to reconsider the fact that Father Tizo, head of the Nazi puppet state in Slovakia, was a priest in holy orders. That the Croatian fascist puppet state, the Ustasha state of Ante Pavlic, was also operating under full clerical protection and disguise, as was the regime of General Franco and the dictator Antonio Salazar. And I'd also want, I really think I would beg forgiveness for this, I don't think the German church should have asked Hitler's birthday to be celebrated from the pulpit every year until he died. These are very serious matters, and they're not to be laughed off by references to the occasional work of Catholic charities. But I draw your attention not just to the apologies, ladies and gentlemen, but to the evasive and euphemistic form that they take. Uh, Joseph Ratzinger, the current pope, considered by some, by Catholics, to be the vicar of Christ on earth, says of Indians, of the Indians who were massacred in the course of conversion in Brazil, after the apology had been made to them, he said, nonetheless, it must be remembered that before we came to convert them, they were silently awaiting the arrival of the church. I don't think that's a very genuine kind of apology to you. In his comment, one of the few he's made on the institutionalization of rape and torture and maltreatment of children in Catholic institutions, he said, it's a very severe crisis, which, which involves us, he said, in the following, in the need for applying to these victims the most loving pastoral care. Well, I'm sorry. They've already had that. <laughs> and to say that this is the responsibility laid upon you by the, the horrific admission that you've already had to make is not accepting responsibility in any adult sense. When I say child abuse was institutional, how dare I say so? How can I prove it? How can I prove such a thing? Well, I'll ask, the, I'll ask His Grace, and I'll ask Anne Whittacombe. Where is Cardinal Bernard Law now? Where is he? Where is the Cardinal Archbishop of Boston, whose resignation was indignantly demanded, finally, by 50 members of the church and by the whole laity of Massachusetts, who also demanded his prosecution for the promotion and protection and covering up and uh, apology for and defense of uh, people whose crimes against children are too revolting to specify. And he's not in the jurisdiction of Massachusetts now, as perhaps you know. He's the Supreme Vicar of the Church of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome, personally appointed by the Pope to that as well as many other important sinecures. And in 2005, this man, a few... Welcome from central London. We're just a stone's throw away from the Houses of Parliament in Westminster. We're here in Central Hall 
for this Intelligence Square debate on the Catholic Church is a force for good in the world. Well, that's a subject that's going to generate a lot of heat, I think, and um, some light too, I hope. I'm delighted to be chair of this debate. We have a panel which includes some of the most provocative, intelligent, and stimulating commentators and practitioners on the subject. Arguing for the motion, the Archbishop of Abuja in Nigeria, John Onayakan, the British Conservative MP, Anne Widdicombe. Arguing against the motion, the actor, broadcaster, and author, Stephen Fry, and the journalist and commentator, Christopher Hitchens. Well, our first speaker is John Onayakan, His Grace, the Archbishop of Abuja, the capital of Nigeria. And His Grace is one of Africa's best known, most respected commentators of the church, the Catholic Church. He was um, appointed Archbishop by John Paul II in 1994. He's also president of the Christian Association in Nigeria. Archbishop, please make your way to the podium. I'm going to give you this little sound to um, warn you that you have about two minutes left before your allotted time is over. So please make your way to the podium. Speak at the microphone. I thank Zainab very much for this uh, wonderful introduction. I see her face so often in BBC. It's nice to see her live. Uh, friends, um, I, must, I certainly must say I'm grateful to be here for this occasion, and I thank Piz, uh, Nick Pisani, our friend, for bringing me here. Not only for bringing me to this occasion, but for giving me the opportunity to speak on this topic, because it's, for me it's more than a matter of debate, because that's what my life is all about. If I didn't believe that the Catholic Church is a force for good, I would not devote my whole life to precisely working in that institution, hoping that I am involved in something that is good for the whole world. And um, I believe that uh, I, this conviction is not without reason. And I, am, I hope that before, before my 12 minutes is over, I would have given enough reasons for it. You see, for me to be a Catholic is a gift of God, but a gift that I received through my parents yeah, and my parents permit me to digress a bit. They were the first generation of Christians in my village. And uh, my father really believed strongly. He, he went beyond the, uh, the, the wonderful traditions of our traditional religion and embraced the Christian faith because he saw in it something better. Not because he didn't like our religion, but he saw something better. Uh, and he remained faithful to that to the very end until he died at 91. Now, I'm, I'm 65 years old, and I've made my own journey, too, along this line. And uh, so far, with no, no regrets. On the contrary, I'm daily, every day, more convinced that the Catholic Church is a force for good in the world. Let me, now pro let me proceed by trying to unpack this, the, some of the major elements in this um, in this topic. Let me start with the word church, the Catholic Church. Obviously, it means many things to many people, but environments, whether it be schools, or hospitals, clinics, refugee camps, HIV and AIDS, in all these areas, if you go to those places, in those circumstances, and ask them, they will tell you that the Catholic Church is a force for good for them, and a force for good for the world. Talking of statistics, I spoke recently with the Director General of UNAIDS, which is the United Nations Agency for HIV and AIDS, and he said that 26% of the health institutions in the world directly involved with the treatment of HIV and AIDS are run by the Catholic Church. And this is an underestimation because I do know that most of, many, many times what we do are not reported to units, which just shows where we are going. The same, thing, kind of, the same thing can be said of schools and clinics. And please note that it is a 
a well-known policy of our church that whenever we are engaged in social welfare work, it is always given to all without, without any discrimination, whether you believe or not, irrespective of creed. Therefore, in a world where very often things go according to sectarian lines and polarized, this is surely a, a great force for good. Mind you, I have not in any way suggested in all have said so far that uh, the Catholics are the best people in the world, far be it. Indeed, it is an integral part of our faith that our church is made up of saints and sinners. We are all struggling towards that perfection which Jesus asked us all to, uh, to first follow. Nor am I denying that the Catholic church has always and everywhere been do, done excellent things, even sometimes in high levels. But uh, this, again, only proves that we are in this world. Even the late Pope John Paul II was, had no difficulty at all in admitting the, the mistakes that people who claim to be, church, to be Catholics and working in the name of the church have done in the past, and even apologized. And such gestures of apology is very rare in our world today. We should also be careful how we judge people of other times because we do not know how those who will come after us will judge us. Let me conclude by, in, by drawing your attention to one particular aspect of my faith which I admire greatly. My, we are very open to dealing and moving and collaborating with others. And this is showing itself more and more, definitely in the countries where I come from. We reach out to others. We have uh, a whole baggage of, of, of uh, doctrinal positions as well as way and policies which encourages us to look around anywhere you see anybody doing good, link hands with them. And I think this is very important for the world of our days. We are talking of the world of today. We need more and more efforts to link hands across all divides so that we can manage to make our planet a better place. A world of justice and peace. Is there still anybody here who still doubts whether the Catholic Church is a force for good in the world? Thank you very much. Archbishop, Archbishop, thank you. And you were admirable in your timing. I didn't have to do this at all to uh, tell you that uh, you were coming to the end of your time. Our next speaker is Christopher Hitchens. He's arguing against the motion. Christopher Hitchens is uh, British by origin, but he has spent most of his working life in the United States. He is a writer, journalist, and commentator, particularly well known for his um, trenchant and uh, views and very original thinking. He works on Vanity Fair magazine where he memorably... I think as an archbishop, I should be in the position to say what it does mean, especially to us Catholics. Yes, the Catholic Church is, is an institution, and some people say it is perhaps the best organized institution in the world, but that's not really the essence of our church. We should go beyond the institution, and for us, the church is first and foremost a community of believers. And this is a community of believers that is spread all over the world, made up of all kinds of people. And the institution itself, as well as those whom we can normally consider church people, people dressed up like me, for example, we are there only because of that huge community of people who claim who are Catholics. I'm stressing this so that when you are asking yourself, is the Catholic Church a force for good in the world, don't look at me, don't look at Benedict XVI, look at the Catholics all over the world. Wherever there is a Catholic, there is the Catholic Church. This is the church that we are talking about in this debate. You meet them, you meet Catholics all over, wherever you are. That the church is a force for good in the world seems obviously to me is quite obvious. The question probably we should ask is, what kind of force? There was once an arrogant dictator who asked in disdain, how many battalions has the Pope? 
Obviously, he completely missed the point. It's not about military force or physical force, but it is about force. It's about the force of a spiritual message, the force of values, which has stood the test of 2,000 years, and not only 2,000 years in time, but has spread its message all over the world among different, different kinds of people, different races, and it is a force that is made up also of the spiritual and the moral, moral values that the faith carries with it. We know we are not the only ones with those values, and especially we share it with other Christians, and we even share it with others who believe in certain, certain strict values about life. And we believe the world is a better place the more there are values that guides activities. The church is a force for good in in, its, uh, in what it teaches. And I want to refer especially recently our Pope wrote out a, an encyclical letter which is our own, a most, a most uh, authoritative teaching in a document he called Caritas in Veritate, meaning charity in the truth. And there he not only, um, he not only analyzed the problems of injustice in our world, but actually came out with very very, very interesting guidelines to assist the world to come out of its present confusion, if they would only listen. Uh, we must also not forget the sheer weight of the number of Catholics. I have checked the statistics, and we are told that now we have about 1.2 billion Catholics all over the world, out of a population of 6.6 .6 billion, 17.3 percent, and these are young, these are made up of all categories of people, young and old, women and men, Present farmers and high-tech professionals, simple citizens, and even heads of states and world leaders. This is the great army that is a great force for good in the world. And whatever they are doing, we consider it as being done largely also as a result of the spirit that guides them. Let us come further to a more concrete area of the kind of things that the Catholic Church does all over the world, the network of initiatives that the church is engaged in, especially in the area of social welfare and development, which people like me, from where I come from, I'm constantly in touch with what the church is doing. Independent statistics have shown that the Catholic Church is doing far more than its numbers and its population would probably suggest. The action of the church is most significant in communities that are reduced to poverty and misery by human neglect and sometimes by hostile... ...wrote a, a rather a less than complimentary profile, I would have to say, Christopher, of uh, the late Mother Teresa. Uh, so, Christopher Hitchens, let us hear what you have to say. Your time starts now. Mm -hmm. Please make your way to the podium. Well, Your Grace, um, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, um, and Zainab, who did something that I almost never have had experienced before, uh, paid a compliment to my shirt before we came on tonight. <laughs> so I was able to return by pointing to hers, which you've, you're feasting your eyes on now, and saying, I once saw Norman St. John Stevas, now Lord Stevas of Forley, wearing a shirt just like that on the television. And he was asked by his interviewer, gosh, what a lovely shirt, where did you get it? And Steve asked, said, do you really like it? He said, I, I call it sort of crushed cardinal. <laughs> I might add, in the spirit of fraternity, which I'm sure will inform this entire soiree, that the mere existence of Lord Steve of Foley is testimony to the breadth of the church. Um, now, I'm sorry, though, to have to begin by disagreeing with his grace. Um, if you're going to be a serious grown-up person and appear to defend the Catholic Church in public in front of an educated and literate audience, you simply have to start by making a great number of heartfelt apologies and requests for contrition and forgiveness. Now you might ask, you're fully entitled to ask, brothers and sisters, who am I to say that? Well, in the Jubilee millennium year of 2000, the Vatican spokesman, Bishop Piero Marini, said, 
explaining a whole sermon of apology given by His Holiness the Pope that was supposed to cover the entire history of the church in its jubilee year, that I'll quote uh, Bishop Marini directly. He said, given the number of sins we've committed in the course of 20 centuries, reference to them must necessarily be rather summary. Well, I think Bishop Marini had that just about right. I'll have to be summary too, but I think he said just about the least of it. His Holiness on that occasion, it was March the 12th, 2000, if you wish to look it up, begged forgiveness for, among some other things, the Crusades, the Inquisition, the persecution of the Jewish people, injustice towards women, that's half the human race right there, <laughs> and the forced conversion of indigenous peoples, especially in South America. And that followed a whole series of preceding apologies, or apologies, I would say, of a kind, made by the late Pope John Paul, who, it troubles me not at all to say, was a very impressive and serious human being. Um, it followed no less than 94, 94 count them, uh, public recognitions on his part of appalling crime and error and cruelty and stupidity and offenses to the free intelligence, ranging from, I shall be summary, like Bishop Marini, the African slave trade apologized for in 1995, uh, the admission that Galileo was right <laughs> about the relationship between the sun and the earth and other orbs, which came in 1992, one might add, and I won't say, it's too easy to say better late than never, here, I said it. <laughs> to violence and torture, legalized torture. Torture was legalized and institutionalized by the Roman pontiff uh, during the Counter-Reformation. That came in 1995. Um, and for silence during Hitler's final solution, or Shoah, as well as in 1999 coming in just under the Millennium Jubilee wire, an apology for the burning alive in the main square of Prague of the great Czech Protestant Jan Hus. Um, since that big fiesta of forgiveness that uh, began in, uh, well, culminated, I might say, in 2000, fiesta of forgiveness, fiesta of asking for it, the papacy is also asked to be forgiven for the sack of Constantinople and the massacre of Byzantine Christianity in April 1204 as part of the Fourth Crusade, the anathema on all Eastern 